This conference will now be recorded. All righty. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be with you. As Jose mentioned, I'm Josh Hunsinger. I'm the Placer County Agricultural Commissioner and Sealer and also uh, the 2021 uh, President of CACASA. So that's uh, that's been quite an adventure this year. I think um, the neatest part of that role has been just really being involved in all of the committees and all of the business of CACASA kind of at a high level and seeing all the different moving parts and seeing where this this group of commissioners is working on this big statewide issue and this other group is working on this and working with the CDFA secretary and the DPR director and their staff and really kind of having that front row seat to the whole statewide um, happenings rather than just focusing on kind of the local area group or my own county or, or whatever. So uh, that's been a pretty cool um, experience this year. Just a little background on myself. I was uh, first hired in Nevada County actually as a gypsy moth trapper back in 1999. And I have the distinction of finding a gypsy moth on my first day at work. So that was pretty cool. So found an A-rated test my first day on the job. So that's that's pretty good track record, I think. Um, the next summer of 2000 started with Placer County as a glassing sharpshooter pierces disease um, seasonal aid um, and worked throughout the summer for Placer County in that capacity and then got hired in the fall as an inspector. And so worked as an ag inspector in Placer County from uh, the level one up to uh, senior inspector in 2006. And then when the deputy here in Placer uh, moved to become the Nevada County Ag Commissioner, um, I then um, got to be the deputy Ag Commissioner here and sealer here in Placer County. We just have a commissioner, deputy, supervising inspector, and then a number of inspectors. So we don't have multiple deputies. So I was the deputy in Placer County from 2006 to 2010. And then in late 2010, uh, my boss, Christine Turner, retired and uh, right at the end of 2010. And then I was appointed at the beginning of 2011 as, um, as the Ag Commissioner here in Placer County. So I've been almost 10 years on that job. I, I counted as 10 because she left in October. And so I've been kind of at least acting in the role for a little over 10 years now. So um, that's a little background on myself. I have a lot of... Uh, a lot of time in the field on pesticide use enforcement, uh, pest exclusion, weight truck, uh, you know, we're a smaller county, so you just get a full variety, a lot of uh, noxious weed work, um, all kinds of different things. So, um, but I, re I really enjoy all of it and uh, get out in the field every chance I get, which just seems like it's about two days a year at best. So, <laughs> uh, miss that part of it, but um, exciting stuff like budgets are, are important too. And I, I work on that stuff quite a bit more than getting out in the field at this point, unfortunately. So with that, um, we'll get started on the, on. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation I've prepared. I will tell you right off the bat, and there's nothing magic that I'm gonna present. That's one thing I want to mention. I also want to mention that um, everything is different from each county, so it's super important. The actual processes and timelines are going to be different from county to county. I'm going to give you a general understanding, but when I say January, your county might do it in December or February, so don't take that to the bank if you're dealing with your specific county. Um, these are just really general things. Some of them I'll try to highlight what's fairly consistent county to county to my knowledge versus what might vary from county to county. But um, I'm going to, this is going to be very high level, more philosophical, more strategic rather than um, a budget itself, which is really just numbers and math. And it's pretty simple at its basic elements. So um, let me get the PowerPoint up here. Um, just Bear with me for one second while I share my screen and we'll make sure that is going on here. So let me um, go ahead and do that. So let's see here. All right, so are we looking good there on that, I think? So um, Jose, give me a thumbs up if you're seeing my PowerPoint. Okay, good, so we'll get started here. 
So first of all, a couple things, as I mentioned, that I want to cover with you. Um, like I said, it, it pays to know what your county does. And it's I almost guarantee you, if you're not a member of the Placer County Ag Department, it's going to be different than what I'm going to tell you. So this is just, it's a little bit of what I know in Placer County. Other counties are very similar, but they're not exactly the same. So learn what the specifics of your county are. If you're preparing for an oral exam, I, I think, you know, having been on enough of those panels, it's good to, um, it's good to mention that, hey, I can't speak for other counties, but here's how we do it in my county. And I think that's always an acceptable answer to give the oral exam panel to say, you know what, I've taken the time to learn my county. I don't have experience in other counties and that's okay. Um, again, I'm gonna cover more strategy rather than math. I'm sure most of you on the call are better at math than I am, but even me with my limited math skills can <laughs> put together a balanced budget. So we're not gonna cover the mathematics of it um, other than a little bit at the very end. Um, Specific to that strategy, I'm going to talk a little bit about relationships, and I want you to listen for the significance of relationships within budgeting, and that might be a little bit outside of what you would normally think about with budgets, but I'm a huge believer in how long-standing relationships and reputation affect your ability to advocate for your own department when budgeting. Um, and then um lastly um we will get started here so uh, i think what we'll do is have a q a section at the end so let me go through my presentation write down your questions and then i'm happy to go back to a particular slide if we need to during the q a but for now i'm gonna go through these slides and then we'll um, go from there so with that powerpoint okay so um First things first, and I have some fun photos here to keep you hopefully awake on a uh, Tuesday afternoon. So back and way up, what's the purpose of a budget? A budget is a plan, and it's a plan for how you wanna prioritize your money. So, that, so your board of supervisors is ultimately gonna approve a certain amount of money for you to spend, and you need to put together a plan on how you're gonna spend that money need to think about these things. The first is your department goals. I should mention right off the bat that most of the money in your budget is not going to be discretionary. It's going to be money that you don't have a choice in how it's spent. If you have a certain number of employees and they all have a fixed salary and a certain benefit rate and you have a certain amount of vehicles and a certain amount of mileage and your facility costs and your utility costs and your IT costs, those things are to, to a large extent outside of your control. But then there is discretionary money and that's really where you need to identify your goals and say, is my goal to spend the money over here or over there? What do I want to accomplish? Which programs am I going to prioritize? Um, so that's that's the first thing is to back way up and say, what are my goals? And is this a one-time expenditure or an ongoing expenditure? Do I need more staff? What do I need to do? And that's really gets into the second point there, which is staff, uh, so anticipated changes. So there's different types of budgets. I'm sure you've studied the difference between like a zero-based budget where you basically have to start over every year and justify every dollar. In Placer County, we typically roll forward with what we call a base budget. And so if you your budget was X dollars last year, you usually start with that same number of dollars rolling forward into the next year. And then anything above and beyond or below last year's budget is where um, a lot of the uh, decision making takes place. So if, uh, you know, like if I have a number of um inspectors who are due for a promotion i gotta look at okay i'm gonna promote three of my inspectors they're now gonna cost more in salary cost and so that's gonna be a change or i'm wanting to add a new position or i need to add a new vehicle or anything like that 
some of the huge changes we've dealt with recently, obviously, would uh, the biggest one would be our gas tax revenue. And over the last uh, couple of years, gas tax revenue has radically increased. And so in anticipating that and building your budget, you need to say, hey, my revenue is actually going to go up a bunch. I also have a maintenance of effort requirement. How am I going to budget based on that significant change that, that I know um, I need to anticipate and plan for? Um, very timely is the discussion of the big picture. I think a lot of times there's a temptation to just look within the ag department. And that's one of the things as you move up through our system. At the inspector level, you don't have to think very much about the rest of the county operation. But I will tell you very clearly that the sheriff in your county and the sheriff's budget has a big impact on your budget. And the overall county, the big picture, and all these the health and human services, the sheriff's department, these other really big departments, and how they're doing financially has an impact on how your department, the ag department, is doing financially. And the overall county, you know, what are sales tax revenues like? What are property tax revenues like for the overall county? And then that affects the general fund, and so that affects your department. And so we don't live in any kind of isolated bubble in the ag department. We're part of a bigger organization called the county government and what's going on overall with the county government is going to a large extent um, dictate what's going on with the ag department's budget and whether you can ask for additional items or whether you're cutting back and doing hiring freezes and things like that so kind of as you move up through the situation or through the system and are promoted into more of those leadership roles that's something you really have to think about is 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 that big picture you can't just live in that isolated little island of the ag department um, again, and here's where we start talking about relationships and, and also the big picture is your board of supervisors. So the board of supervisors are ultimately the five people, and I think it's more in San Francisco County if you're there, so, um, um, but those are the elected representatives who ultimately approve the county budget. And so again, in that sense of as you move up into leadership, and are more responsible for things like your department's budget, you need to be aware of what the Board of Supervisors priorities are. And they might be different from the priorities spelled out in the Food and Ag Code. Food and Ag Code might really heavily, you know, it, it heavily prioritizes pest prevention programs. But my Board of Supervisors, while they care about pest prevention, they also care about promoting agriculture and doing things like promoting wineries and promoting ag tourism and things like that. So they want me to also recognize within my budget some work on those types of priorities in addition to pest prevention activities like pest exclusion and pest detection. So if I didn't include those other things, I would be sideways with my board who are ultimately my bosses. So that factors into that budget building. And then also the multi-year projects. So there's ongoing expenses and there's one-time expenses. And so they're treated typically a lot differently. So they're, they're you know, an ongoing expense. So if I hire an employee this year, because I have money this year, but I don't have money next year, I can't hire a full-time permanent position because even though I can afford it this year, I'd have to lay them off right again next year. So it's not smart if I don't have ongoing funding to hire a permanent employee who would be an ongoing cost. So that, that's an example of that. So versus you know buying a piece of equipment, you buy it once and then you own it and there might be some maintenance fees, costs attached to it, but um, if there's not, then it's a one-time purchase and the expense comes and goes and then it's off the books. So um, really being aware of what type of expense you're actually proposing, very important. So, uh, all right, so we're gonna go into a little bit of philosophy here now. And this is again where uh, relationships and reputation are so critical. And I'm a huge believer in this. And my ultimate goal 
is down there at the bottom to identify those key people in my organization. So whether it's a board member, whether it's somebody in my CEO's office that's an analyst that I work with or someone in a different department or whatever, I want those key people to understand what my department does understand the importance of it and not just understand the importance of it but also believe in the importance and become an ally and an advocate for me so they say that stuff that the ag department is doing is super important and i understand it and i want to support it um, and that's the ultimate goal and so you know, I have up there at the top of this slide, agent of change versus status quo. And I'm a big believer in being an agent of change. And by that, I mean, when I go to a place, I want to leave it better than where I found it. It's very easy to just stick in your rut and go, oh, nobody supports me. I'm losing staff or I'm not going to ever gain any new staff or, oh, it'd be really nice to have that cool piece of equipment, but we can never afford that. I'd love to have an uh, you know, electric vehicle charging equipment, but that's expensive. I'll probably never get it. I'll have to rely on the state. It's very easy to get in that rut and just saying, you know, poor little ag department, we don't have a lot of support. I'm very opposed to that approach. I really want to, you know, and not overnight, but be someone who's constantly improving my department and and leaving it better than when our, when I when I found it. My reputation is very important to me when I come to budgeting. My goal is to have the people who control my budget, so my CEO's office, my board of supervisors, they believe that I'm competent when it comes to handling my budget, that I'm frugal, like a tightwad, that, I, that I'm careful with it, that I treat that money as though it's my own. We got to remember that every single dollar that hits our departments comes from a taxpayer's pocket, whether it's through a fee or through a tax. Every dollar in our budgets, every dollar in every one of our salaries comes out of a taxpayer's pocket. And we got to keep that sacred and treat it as though we're looking that taxpayer in the eye when we spend that dollar. And so um, I treat every dollar in my department that way. I view them that way. And that reputation is really powerful if you can cultivate that. Also, having a good plan. So when I first became the deputy in Placer County, we had a situation with a weight truck where uh, we didn't have a very good weight truck and I really wanted a new one. And it was right during the economic downturn of like 2008, 2009. And I said, how am I going to get $120,000 or whatever weight truck in the middle of an economic downturn? And where I started with that was having a good plan. And so before I went to my CEO's office and my board of supervisors and said, hey, I want to spend $120,000, I created a whole plan and I figured out how we were going to pay for it, how having a new truck that had less maintenance requirements was going to save us money, it was going to save us time because it wasn't going to break down laid out every facet of that request and i didn't breathe the word of it to anybody until i had a really good plan in place and that i could hand to them and say i've got a full game plan i'm not going off half-baked here and i think that's a really important point you don't ask for things unless you have a rock solid plan rock solid justification and have a reputation for not asking for toys that you don't need. That's such a big one. When I talk to my financial people in the CEO's office and they say, oh my gosh, these departments just come in in May and June at the end of the fiscal year and just go on these spending sprees and buy all this junk, that destroys their reputation and they don't, they lose all of their, um, their kind of, their, their points that they have stored up, so to speak when they do that kind of behavior, where I would rather return a little money to the county general fund at the end of the year because I didn't spend it, than, than spend it on things I don't truly need. And that reputation, that's not a one-time, one-year kind of a thing. That's something you build up over many years. So when you do ask for something, they say, oh, here comes Josh. 
He's asking for something. He never asks for something unless he actually needs it. And that's such a key point. And then finally, this is the salesmanship. Um, the, the, the fact that we're doing important work. Guess what? Nobody's going to know about all the important work we do unless we tell them and we show them and we teach them. And it's not a one time like, hey, we're doing really important stuff. It's an over and over and over again type of thing where it finally clicks with these important decision makers over time. Uh, we've prepared for, for my county, we have a little what we do document. It's literally called what we do. And it's this little booklet. And I hand it out to new board members, new aides to my board of supervisors, uh, new CEO staff. And they get that and we walk through it and then I go over it and I repeat it and they over time figure it out. And, and there's always some key thing we do that they think is cool or they've had a personal experience with like, you know, credit card skimmers on gas pumps. That's a great one. Everybody's like, oh yeah, I've seen that in the news. Oh, you guys have a role in that, awesome. And just those little things you can latch on to and really build a relationship with. And, you know, and that's to that last point of education. You know, most people don't know we exist, much less what we do. And that's part a big part of your job in this whole thing. You can't ask for money until people actually understand what you're going to spend it on. So um, hope that's helpful. Let's go to the next uh, the next slide here. And I have the key point down at the bottom of that slide is failure to plan is planning to fail. So you have to be thinking really strategically and long term. I know for myself with budgeting and with workload, I think simultaneously in a lot of different time frames. So I think about what do I want to accomplish on a daily basis? So that's that's pretty mundane stuff like, you know, I need to return some emails and phone calls and I need to talk to this person. And then kind of weekly, hey, by the end of the week, I want to get this project out the door. And then monthly, I need to do X, Y, and Z and get it done this month. And then as you get into a three month time frame and a six month time frame and a year long time frame, you're really looking at that overall annual cycle and breaking it down into four quarters and saying, hey, what are the things that are I can anticipate happening this year and how am I going to accomplish all that? And then there's those really big ticket items, like I mentioned, like starting from scratch on buying a weight truck or adding a new employee or a new building or something like of that magnitude. And that's gonna be like a five-year window. Um, you know, when I get new, new staff and we start working on some of these things, I say, hey, county wheels move pretty slow. And if you want something expensive or big or different, it's gonna take a while to accomplish. So kind of simultaneously managing all these different timeframes within your workload that you're, you're working on and your budget you know, uh, that that's really key. Like if you're gonna ask for a big ticket item, it's gonna take a few years to get it probably, unless something miraculous happens and you get a windfall of money or something like gas tax. Um, and so you have to work on it and you have to continuously move it forward one step at a time over, over some period of time. Simultaneous to that, you have to also be managing your daily, weekly and monthly tasks and getting all your work done. And so that's really the art of it. So that's kind of from a time frame standpoint how I how I approach budgeting. So okay. So now we'll get a little more into some of the real basics of um, budgeting and go through some of these, you know, the nuts and bolts of a budget or the components. And so these are some of the terms. And these are like if you're taking a deputy exam or a commissioner oral exam, commissioner sealer oral exam, these are really important terms to be familiar with. They're also just excellent general knowledge as you um, grow in your job and get exposed to these. So obviously revenue. Revenue is, is a nice term. Um, that is the term for the money that comes to you. So whether you have a contract or you charge a fee or you, you know, impose a fine or whatever, that is all revenue that comes to you. And so half of your budget or one of the one of the two broad components of your budget is your revenue budget. And so you say, 
from these various sources, I anticipate collecting X amount of money. The second one, the counter to revenue is expenditures. So that's the money that leaves you. So that is all of the money that you spend. So the, rev the revenue is the money that comes to you, the expenditures are the money that leaves you. And these are very general broad terms. Um, the general fund, and I think there's a lot of different terms for a general fund, it's GF, the county contribution, net county cost, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of others. Those are just some of the ones we use interchangeably here, Placer County. Um, but typically, for, you know, to my knowledge, most, if not all, agriculture weights and measures departments, the expenditure number is bigger than the revenue number. And when the expenditure number is bigger than the revenue number, the difference is made up by county general funds. So just to make up a hypothetical, if your expenditures are a million dollars and your revenues are $800,000, then the general fund is going to have to make up $200,000. So that's not revenue that you directly collect into your budget. That is county general fund, which are general tax dollars that come to your county and they don't have strings attached to them other than you know the government code legal constraints on them and then the board of supervisors gets to decide how to allocate that general fund and so that's a really important um, thing to consider when we talk about um, gas tax and annual financial statements in a minute as well so supplemental requests, that's a term here in Placer County. I'm sure there's lots of other terms for it, but that's, you know, we have a base budget that we start off of. And then if I want things above and beyond that, they become what are called supplemental requests. So in addition to my base, I want additional things on top of that. Those are called supplemental requests. And I've, I've kind of been a little silly with the basics of these descriptions, but they're, um, you know, it's not super complicated. It's not brain surgery or rocket science. It's, it's you know, the, just think of these in these simple terms. Staff is a really important thing when it comes to building a budget because warm bodies, human beings are typically the most expensive part of your budget. Um, the people that work for you um, are really expensive. They, uh, they have salary costs, obviously but then they also have benefit costs. And so really understanding all of those benefit costs and cool things like uh, medical insurance, dental insurance, um, retirement benefits. We have like a line item, I think for OPEB, which is other post-employment benefits, workers' comp insurance. There's, I don't know, five or six different line items just for benefits in my county. And so understanding those and the fact that for every dollar we pay out in salary, we pay out another about 60 cents or so. So 60% of every dollar is also then spent on benefits. So um, it's a pretty significant cost. Um, at least, you know, that's kind of the ratio here in my county. So um, really as staffing levels go up and down, that's typically the most powerful driver in where you end up with your budget um, and your expenditures in particular. Um, stuff or items, these are the things you buy. So that's another component of your budget. So if you're purchasing equipment, that is the stuff you buy. And so that also is usually a significant part of your budget. And then services, these are things that other people do for you that are not your employees. So these could be internal services, like if you have an IT department, county council, your auditor controller, all of those kinds of folks that provide services to your department, your building maintenance or your facilities, um, those would be internal. And then there's external, like if you hire a contractor to do something for you, that would be an external service cost. And so these are these are just some of, there's other things, other components to your budget, but these are big the big ticket, high level items. Um, I think, again, if you're preparing for an exam or something, really understanding what each of these components is, should serve you well. Slide advancement is funky here. Okay, so this is again a great example that on this slide of where understanding your individual county and how your individual county works is really important. This is this is basically a Placer County calendar 
I would assume that this is relatively close to what most other counties do. Um, things like the fiscal year don't change. Every county is the same as far as the fiscal year dates and the state operates off the same fiscal year dates, but a lot of these other things may vary to some extent. So for so just so we understand for Placer County, this is what I this is what we do. Your county is probably a little bit different or maybe maybe a little bit similar. So a fiscal year for everybody except the federal government. So state government, local government here in California is July 1st through June 30th. It's not on a calendar year basis, it's on a fiscal year basis. So when you look at like our, our recent noxious weed eradication contracts, they span several fiscal years because they cover calendar years. Um, so you gotta be aware of that when you're looking at like revenue contracts and stuff, they, they may span several fiscal years or not. Um, and that gets a little complicated sometimes. And you can also do some strategy around which year do I want my revenue to come into. Um, so July 30th or, or July 1st through June 30th is the fiscal year. So for my county, we start preparing our budget, which starts July 1st. We start preparing that budget usually in January. So my CEO office sends out a budget template and says, start working on this. It's due around the end of February or the beginning of March. So then we submit that budget. Simultaneously, we're at the 50% mark on the fiscal year. So, so January 1st is the midpoint of the fiscal year. So we will also kind of working through December and into January, look at the halfway point in our current year budget while simultaneously preparing for our next fiscal year's budget. And if there's a, adjustments that need to be made, like, oh, we got more revenues that we, than we anticipated, or we're running a little hot on our expenditures and need to make an adjustment, those kinds of things would be addressed in like December or January timeframe, while we're also preparing our next fiscal year's budget. And then typically in March and April, we start reviewing what my department has submitted through my CEO's office and my board of supervisors and saying, okay, this is what you're asking for. We support this. We have some concerns about that. We're unclear on that. We start having those types of discussions and negotiations. And then sometime in either May or June, finally, that action item to approve the county's um, preliminary budget is, is uh, brought to the board of supervisors for approval. And that has to be done prior to July 1st, so that on July 1st, we have a new approved budget to work off of. However, between July and August, there's often a lot of closeout at the end of the fiscal year. Some counties may call it month 13, and obviously a year only has 12 months, but what they call it is, at least in my county, is month 13, where they're kind of truing up all the end of the year close out of the past fiscal year and any last minute adjustments to, to make everything squared away. Once that process is done kind of by August or so, we have a pretty good sense of any additional changes that need to be made to the now current year fiscal year budget. And then we'll typically come back in like September and make any final tweaks to what we call our final adopted budget. And then also in September, we start looking at our unclaimed gas tax and working on our annual financial statement that we need to submit to CDFA. So it kind of follows on that once we close out the previous fiscal year, that's where we can start on our annual financial statement for that fiscal year. So let's talk about that a little bit. So the annual financial statement, hopefully everybody's familiar with that, the AFR or AFS, depending on what you wanna call it due on October 31st of each year. Um, it takes quite a bit to prepare that document. I'm not gonna get into the nuts and bolts of that. That's another conversation and another presentation for you. Um, but it's due on October 31st. Typically, at least in my county, we don't get to start working on it till August, just because we're closing out all that year end stuff and making sure the numbers are final. Um, the significance of that report is that our unclaimed gas tax revenue is based on that report that we submit. So that's our largest, typically our largest single source of revenue. And so it's a really important document. Um, it is, again, going back to the relationships and the reputation and the education that you are responsible for as a leader in your department. 
this is a really hard counterintuitive thing to explain to people outside of your department. Some of your really uh, detailed fiscal folks in your auditor's office or your CEO or CAO's department may understand it. Your budget people may, but um, that whole, we spend money in order to get money back in revenue in the next fiscal year, it's, it's, it's pretty complex to explain. And that's why it's always a big uh, study topic on exams and stuff. Um, so that's where that education and that relationship and that constant kind of communication with your decision making um, folks is really, really important. The other thing that's really important to note relative to budgeting is that gas tax payments typically come in in late March or into April most commonly. Now the fiscal year ends in the end of June. And so if your biggest chunk of revenue that you've budgeted for doesn't come till April, till mid-April, you may have, especially if you have new fiscal management folks um, working on your budget, they may be paying attention to that and going, hey, we're two thirds of the way through the fiscal year and you've only collected less than half of your revenue for the year. We're really concerned. And that's again where you have to educate them and say, yes this portion of my revenue budget will not come in till april and so don't sweat it we're keeping an eye on it and we're communicating with cdfa and all is well and that that's a big point to uh to uh, educate those you know especially when you get a new analyst who hasn't gone through an annual budget cycle with you yet because they can get really antsy about um where your revenues at um th that late in the fiscal year the other big thing along the lines of reputation and education is the maintenance of effort and all the strategy that goes around how much money you spend, the general fund contribution. We had kind of what I would classify as a windfall in the last couple of years in gas tax revenue. And it was really important to communicate to CACASA's membership to say, you got to proactively work with your, your fiscal analysts and your CEO's office and your board to help them understand that if they replace your general fund with this new gas tax revenue, you will not meet your maintenance of effort and therefore you will not get money the next year from gas tax. You, you, you stand a good chance of forfeiting your gas tax revenue in the next year. So um, that, that's a real, that was a really tough lift for a number of counties who struggled with that and um, had to kind of sell that concept to their management. Um, and so there's a lot of strategy around that. We could spend all day just talking about that and how you spend money strategically and advocate for, for things that will help you maintain your maintenance of effort and your, your gas tax revenue. So, um, for now, I'll just leave it at that and we can talk more about that in the question and answer if you'd like to. Lastly, I just wanna reiterate that none of this stuff is rocket science. Um, this is literally how I think about our budgets. I try to be a little bit conservative when I budget. I don't like, I get really, really nervous if we spend our exact budget and collect our exact amount of budgeted revenue. I always wanna collect more revenue than I budget for. I commit to collecting $100 in my budget, I want to actually collect $125 just so I'm safe. And even if that extra $25, you know what I'm saying, hypothetically, if that $25 just goes back to the general fund, so be it. I'd rather do that than only collect $90 and have to explain why I overpromised and underdelivered. Same thing with your expenditures, spend less than you budget for overestimate slightly. Now, if you get really sloppy and are just having massive hundreds of thousands of dollars in unspent funds, you're probably gonna get your hand slapped and a lot more scrutiny of your budget. But be conservative, bring in more revenue than you promise, spend less than you propose to, identify and communicate with key staff in the other departments that manage your budget. So whether it's your CEO or CAO's office, your auditor controller, your board of supervisors, all of those offices are super important and keep up on the communication with them. If you get in trouble, the earlier you let them know, the more help they can be to you. They don't want your department to fail, They, but they do 
not like surprises. And so finally, remember the value and purpose of what your department does. We don't just do pest exclusion activities because we like opening packages and looking at plants. We do it because we are protecting the environment and the public and our agriculture industry in California from invasive pests. There's an important reason why we do each and every program that we do. And so keep that in mind and advocate for these programs because they are really important. So with that, I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen here. I'll bring it back and, um, and um, we will uh, open it up for questions and answers. So I, I hope you're all still engaged here and I hope this was informative and helpful to you. Very good, actually. So everybody's on mute right now. Feel free to unmute yourself. I have a couple of questions that were sent to me, but actually I want to, you know, open the floor up for any any questions, follow-ups that you would like Josh to uh, help us understand here. Uh, I did want to echo some of the elements Josh covered. I, I've helped with the with a couple of budgets, and you know, having that philosophy of understanding that tactical not just the technical as josh mentions every budget concept breaks into two the technical you can learn how to use sherpa you can learn how to use people so that's the technical how you put the numbers in there the the philosophy and the tactical is learning how to calculate and anticipate what are the changes how, what are the staffing changes what are the upcoming costs you know you look at the mous to see what colas your employees are getting the larger the department you work for, the larger the impact a 5% or a 4% call over the next fiscal year is going to be. So you're going to need to um, allocate that in your budget. If you don't, your analyst and the budget office in the county looks at it regularly. And I was actually um, smiling a little bit when Josh was talking about the analyst calling. They call me at first quarter because 25, either my expenditures are not at 25 or my revenue is not at 25. And it's a very casual call. At the mid-year process, they expect me to be at approximately 50% expenditures, but also 50% revenue. They do start getting very nervous because our budget, it's an aggregate budget for the whole county. It's a component of an aggregate budget, and they are monitoring the entire county. They're looking at the departments who are not making the revenue or who are significantly exceeding or even under uh, uh, underspending their expenditures because if we are going to be underspent, they want to take that money and be able to put it somewhere else where they're going to be able to use it within the same fiscal year. So with that said, uh, we'll open it up for any questions that you may have here for Josh. Don't be shy. You're all on unmute. Feel free to unmute yourselves. <laughs> Hi, this is Victor from the city and county in San Francisco. Um, there's one thing that you brought up and, and Jose brought it up who looks at these budgets as a work plan i mean a work plan is a separate document but but when the analysts look at this our monies with the ugt it comes in at different times and jose described that that the money doesn't come how do you advocate to tell them look for every dollar we spend in the general fund if you're just patient you're going to get 40 cents especially in these tight times how do you navigate those kind of politics or that kind of diplomacy of let us do what is mandated let us do what is covered by, by, by the fact so that we get some more revenue because I think that's going to be a pressure going forward because a lot of our fees have, have dropped dramatically and I want to be able to argue with the budget or with a work plan what is the best tool to advocate that for every dollar we spend you get 40 cents yeah um, for myself I would say that is a constant you know I, I'm probably sound like a broken record but at the same time that is such an important topic that in a, any time I get a new analyst, a new fiscal analyst who's, who's overseeing my department, that is a dedicated meeting. I mean, that, that point that you just made, that is worth a dedicated meeting to me because it's such an, and I think gas tax is actually more like 60 cents on the dollar now that- uh, Really? Wow. SB, yeah. It was traditionally about 39 to 40 cents. And then when the SB1 revenues started coming in, it, I think it, jump to more like 60 cents on the dollar. Um, so that is something where for myself, 
I have a meeting every so once in a while with the actual county CEO. I'm talking to him about it. I'm talking to the deputy CEO that's over my department. I'm talking to my own analyst who's assigned to my department. I'm talking to the super nerdy fiscal guys who actually oversee and build the county budget itself. And I'm making sure every one of them knows about this issue and gets it. And that's my goal. And that takes time and it takes a lot of effort, but it's super important. And you have to be very proactive in that education and also consistent and constant with it. It's not a one and done kind of a thing. Yeah. Victor, uh, I, I, and I agree with uh, Josh, definitely. That it takes effort to keep them in the know of how budgeting works for the Ag Department. It is a big reason why we are licensed individuals. So you have to be licensed to be in this business. If you want to be a deputy, if you want to be a commissioner and sealer, you have to have a license. And part of the license is understanding this that we're talking about. And a, a way that you use that is, uh, let's say, as you said, let's say our work plan, we had a contract and I get the news from CDFA that the funding suddenly went away and they're going to cut it by half, but I still want to be able to do that work. I can go to downtown and ask for a general fund approval for that amount. And I can explain it to them. I'm, them, I'm asking you for $100,000 additional general fund to finish the year. However, if it's above the line, agricultural, one of the 12 categories, I can let them know we'll spend 100,000, but that money is gonna contribute to our maintenance of effort, which in turn next year will come back in the tune of six cents to the dollar in unclaimed gas tax revenue. So in reality, you're getting $160,000 of service to our local citizens for something very meaningful, whether it's controlling a pest or eradicating a pest at the cost to the county of 100,000. There's, the, there's ways to really, and it's not a lie, it's really what it is. It's a matter of understanding I mean, it and being able to sell it. I mean, there's few investments that have that return. And I mean, and it keeps people employed, it keeps people busy, it keeps things public, it keeps, it keeps uh, fixed costs and asset costs you know mm -hmm. running and, and and it's just it's amazing how hard it is to explain uh to different types of people with different types of goals i mean the analysts will see it will see it very differently than the board of supervisors as a a pet project that they think is more important than the mandate so it's quite a political position i, I know it belongs mostly to the commissioner and the sealer but if there's any support and any small dialogue that we can have from the inspector up it's very important to advocate for these programs to continue yeah yeah. And, and there are times you, oh go ahead jose i was gonna say i was just gonna add quickly another thing you can do is when you're making this request even if it's coming from an inspector supervisor deputy you can do some of the legwork go to the county page the county budget if you haven't read it there is a county budget it's a big group yep. they have their mission their vision their priorities if there's ways that you can align meaningful elements of your request yep. with the county's priorities with whatever the priority is we have programs that touch every single priority, whether it's social, environmental, business, every, things that we do touch everything. So the, the goal is that you can frame your request, not only on the money part, but also on the meaningful part to go to the CAO, to go to the board and say, hey, look, the county's five priorities are this. This project aligns very cleanly with these three elements that are county priorities. So now it's no longer the Ag Department's uh, goal. It contributes to the county's goal. Yeah, okay. and I was just gonna say, there are times when you'll get told too with the gas tax, hey, it's still a 40% hit on the general fund. You know, so yeah, it's, it's all well and good that we get 60 cents back on the dollar, but you know, you're still asking for that 40 cents in general fund and you know, some, and that's just part of the game too. You know, and you gotta be prepared for that. And so that's where the prioritization and I think what Jose just said is is brilliant because almost guarantee you that your county probably has some economic development, broad board of supervisors priorities around things like economic development, quality of life, environmental protection, these kinds of things. And so if you can explain how the program you're asking for support for aligns with those things, that's huge. So thank you, Jose. I, I so thank you guys and I'll, I'll end it there, but that, that really stresses the importance of building relationships with other people because everybody's baby is very important and you really have to negotiate, basically. Yep. You have to have relationships. Yeah, thank you very much. Excellent. So, Josh, we have a couple of questions. I'll read you the first one. What yep. happens to the program when the funding is cut mid -year through the, mid, midway through the year? Like, wh what happens to your budget, to your department, if the budget suddenly gets reduced? How do you navigate that? 
Uh, you know, let's let's think about that. So so with that, Jose, do you read that to be more of like if a CDFA contract went away, or more like like is that kind of what the question is about, or? I think so. Or a sudden reduction in the maximum general fund allocation for your department. I can see it that way also. Yeah. Basically, how do you time the build in the middle of the year? <laughs> right. So I think there again, the first thing is the relationships and the communication and education like we talked about. So making sure everybody that matters is aware of, hey, this happened. First of all, this is going on. This is the situation I have so that they're not surprised by it or un caught unaware. And then understanding what that impact is. Um, what are the costs of that program? It's probably pretty much, you know, this is like a classic kind of a deputy question almost, yeah. of, you know. <laughs> so, you know, it's like people are probably the most expensive part of any program. And so then you have to look at, okay, can I reallocate those people to, you know, first of all, can I get the money from a different source? Like, can I go to my board of supervisors and say, hey, I lost this contract? or this revenue didn't come in like I thought it would, I don't wanna lay off people, and so can you replace that with you know, general funds? So that would be the you know, kind of the first general kind of approach. And then secondly, are there other funded programs you could put those people into to you know, avoid layoffs? You know, is there a different way to accomplish the same work in a more efficient manner? You just, you just gotta kind of go down that role of what actually happened, informing people informing the right people and asking them for help looking at you know how how where in the priority scale is that program and maybe you get rid of something else and keep doing it even though it doesn't pay or you know ultimately you know kind of layoffs is your last resort certainly but you know obviously with a lot of our programs we can you know lay off seasonal people a lot easier than more permanent staff and transfer the work to permanent staff if we have to so it's none of this is super complicated it's just you have to kind of go through it methodically and and cover all the bases yeah ultimately you might end up with the shuffle if you have a mandated activity that suddenly lasts funding it's still a mandated activity so you might have to shuffle certain things certain activities allocation of hours for non for non-mandated and funded you know activities there, there's a shuffle that could happen within your department to meet your mandates so ultimately i think that's a high priority meeting your mandates yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. next question, how much impact, if any, do you think COVID will have to the UGT bucket or availability? Yeah, great question. And we've been talking like, so we have a, a gas tax subcommittee within CACASA. So I think Louis Mendoza in Butte County is the chair of that and um, work really closely with him on that. We've, we've been talking with CDFA a lot about that issue. And I think the things, that are important to remember is that the overall gas tax in the state I think is down because people are telecommuting instead of driving into work a lot. So there's a lot less vehicle miles being traveled and a lot less gas being burned. However, our gasoline tax does not come from on-road vehicles. It comes from off-road vehicles. And so farming equipment and landscaping equipment, leaf blowers, weed eaters, tractors, those kinds of things are where our gas tax is derived from. That's the whole point of it being unclaimed because theoretically all these businesses could claim it on their taxes and get a refund, but none of them track it, none of them request that refund, and so that's why that pool of money exists in the first place. So people commuting does not, or not commuting does not theoretically affect the gas tax. The other thing is that it's calculated on an every two, two year basis. And so we're in the middle of a two year calculation between Caltrans and CDFA. So I believe next year they'll be looking at that again. And so for the time being, it's kind of status quo and there's no immediate impact. It may be in a year or so if we see like, hey, there was a lot less landscaping or a lot less farming going on based on CDFA and Caltrans is, I think it's mostly a Caltrans uh, calculation, some of their magic math that they do on that, that would be where we'd see an impact. But I think first and foremost, the thing we've, we've really settled on is it's not, people's telecommuting does not affect unclaimed gas tax in general, in a broad sense. All right, excellent. Uh, next question. Uh, the examples you gave are all exclusion, et cetera, for unclaimed gas tax. 
what about weights and measures funding or expenditures? Uh, if you can talk a little bit about weights and measures, uh, funding sources and expenditures. Yeah. So weights and measures is different, obviously, in that it's it's below the line, not eligible for unclaimed gas tax reimbursement. And also the other big difference fundamentally is that weights and measures has a dedicated revenue source. Unlike, unlike pesticide use enforcement or most of our pest prevention activities, we we are not allowed to charge a fee. Like when someone has a shipment of plants arrive that we need to inspect, we can't charge a fee. Where we have device registration fees for our weights and measures activities. I would suspect in most counties, I know in mine certainly, those registration fees do not cover um, the cost of that program. That would be an ideal um, goal to strive for. And I think that's something where looking at really scrutinizing your expenditures, scrutinizing the efficiency of your weights and measures programs, and especially your device inspection fee program, looking at things like variable frequency of inspection as maybe a way to say, hey, we're just spinning our wheels. We're wasting a bunch of time inspecting a bunch of really, really accurate devices that we maybe don't need to look at every single year because they're always with intolerance. So why are we spending all of our time running around looking at super accurate gas pumps or scales um, and gaining some efficiency? So, so I think goal number one is to align your expenditures with your revenues to the greatest extent possible. Um, I know for, for my office, it's a combination of, again, helping my board of supervisors to understand the importance of that consumer protection that the general fund, the general fund does make up the difference in my department. And so that's where really that education and that advocacy for the importance of that program comes in so that they continue to support it. Um, I would say, you know, even things like, you know, when we, co we collaborated with the sheriff's department on opening up some pumps that they suspected had, uh, had uh, skimmers in them. And the sheriff puts out a really nice social media post about how we helped them open up the gas pumps and they found these skimmers. And you know the sheriff has this giant following on social media. Our board of supervisors and their aides and their staff see that kind of thing and go, oh man, Joshua's department is, is doing good work there. You know, and I don't even have to toot my own horn and tell them myself because the sheriff's doing it for me. So those little kinds of strategic things where you can partner and have other people even sing your praises is awesome um, when it comes to that stuff. So those are a few of my thoughts on weights and measures. I, I echo that, uh, Josh. And, you know, adding to it a little bit is the, the mission of the weights and measures program. It is one of the, if not the most visible program that we operate. In addition to that, it's a program that you can tell any board of supervisor any day. They'll immediately be able to recognize it by the, the minute you tell them about the seal on the gas pump. They'll know what it is. And you can actually, actually tell them, you know, this program protects every single consumer. If somebody has bought something today, the likelihood that our program impacted or the assurance that that person got what they paid for is part of this program. That's how meaningful it is. Um, I, I think that's why the Board of Supervisors and the CAOs are always willing to uh, contribute a general fund towards weights and measures. Of course, there's an industry benefit, and that's where the fees come in to help support the program. But there is actually an individual benefit to every single person that purchases anything in your county, whether it's by weight, measure, count, and that's how you sell it. It's, yeah. it, it benefits the people, so therefore the taxpayer of the general public is appropriate to be allocated to those programs. Yeah. Um, I think Truly, some of these programs, I think something to keep in mind too, and every county is different, but ag departments are typically a pretty small department. And so sometimes the dollar figures that seem big to us aren't necessarily significant in the grand scheme of things. Like, you know, my whole department budget's about $3 million out of a billion dollar county budget. And so if I'm asking for, you know, if I have a, you know, my my weights and measures program costs two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year in general fund or whatever it costs. That seems like a whole lot of money to me for my three million dollar budget, but in the grand scheme of a one billion dollar budget, uh, you know, it's 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 a lot of money. And like I said, I treat that as though I'm looking the taxpayer who paid it in the eye when I spend it. But at the same time, it's you know 
things that may seem like a big ask to you may not be a big ask to other people in the grand scheme of things. So. Yeah. All right. So the next question is has to do with above the line. What does it mean? And how are programs put together in the budget on each side of the line? Maybe talk a little bit about what is that line? <laughs> <laughs> So the art is to keep as many of your expenditures that are unreimbursed above the line as possible. So, um, so what the line is just, in, and this is probably a, uh, I would encourage you, we have our Kakasa um, YouTube channel. I think if you just search Kakasa training or something on YouTube, you'll find it. There's actually an unclaimed gas tax uh, presentation on there, which covers that in great detail. It's a little bit old and I need to redo it with uh, Louis Mendoza, but I haven't gotten around to that yet. The concepts are still totally valid though. Short story is above the line expenditures are those agricultural regulatory expenditures, which are eligible for unclaimed gas tax reimbursement. So it's pesticides. I think, what is it? It's pesticides plus the other 10 or 11 food and ag code programs. So if, if something you're doing is authorized through the California food and ag code, it is above the line. If it's authorized through the California business and professions code or somewhere else, it is below the line. That's the simplest way to think about it. And so above the line is just kind of a term that's very unique to ag commissioners to mean uh, eligible for gas tax reimbursement. If you look at your county's annual financial report, the expenditures and revenue table, it'll have all the programs, one through 10, 11, and I think 12. If you look at the one through 11, those are all your agricultural expenditures, pesticides, quarantine, exclusion, and there is no line other than a double line below the numbers, but I, I always think of that as the line. If your expenditure doesn't fit or your revenue does not fit on any of those categories above, it goes below, whether it's your contribution to uh, UCCE, whether it's hazardous materials, if your county does hazardous materials, whether it's weights and measures, and you know, kind of the, the tactical part of the budgeting or addressing when there's a shortfall of money is understanding how that impact, you know, cutting $100,000 from one side versus the other, has a significant impact down the down the timeline as you go to next year's fiscal budget when you do your annual financial when you're looking at unclaimed gas tax i think the role of the deputies and commissioners and sealers is to really to observe that and understand the philosophy of how that works what does it mean above the line or below the line uh, yeah. above the line is basically programs that are outlining by legislature they're outlining the foot and equity to 24 g that's what yeah. above the line is anything outside of that is below the line yeah and I think really this highlights, you know, I'm assuming everybody on this call and members of KSAP are people who want to grow in their job and continue to become leaders in this in this industry or this this uh, unique work that we do. And reading the food and ag code is part of your job. I mean, I tell my staff, if you got nothing else going on, you can always read the code. You can always read the food and ag code, the BMP code and the California code of regulations. There's always I'm still finding like, hey, I didn't know that that was a, you know, a law that affects me. I'm still finding stuff after 20 years of doing this. And so yeah, 224 and 224.5, the food and ag code are a place to start. Asking your management staff for a copy of the annual financial statement. It's like a simple two page, easy to understand document that's an overview and you can literally see the line on the piece of paper. So yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, excellent, all right. So next question, um, besides device registration fees, county ordinances for point of sale, what other funding sources, at, sources are available for weights and measures? Are the only two DMS contracts, Waymaster and Petroleum product uh, signage, the only revenue sources? Do you know of additional revenue sources? I think there's uh, registered service agents as well in there, aren't there? Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, so the, the the significant ones would be the point of sale ordinances and the device registration fees. Um, a number of counties have partnered with their district attorney's offices on large cases, and there can be some pretty significant settlements out of those. Um, I have not seen very many settlements where the ag department directly gets a massive financial windfall. Um, a lot of those settlements go into our QC trust funds 
that CACASA maintains along with the District Attorneys Association. And so that's a great source. If you need training and equipment to do price verification work, um, you know, that's that's a little bit of something to talk to your 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 commissioners and deputies and assistants about is there's a great source of revenue. It's a lot of money sitting there waiting to be used. And we really need to get that money going more. We've we've applied for some, it's basically a really simple grant application process. I think you submit to um, LA County and then there's a committee that reviews those applications. And so you can get, you know, within reason, some pretty good financial support for equipment and training relative to price verification program. Um, other than, like I said, fines, I'm not sure if there's a whole lot of other device device related revenue that you can kind of, you know, in an entrepreneurial sense, go find, um, um, you know, that that's set in the business and professions code. It's in state law. It's capped. You know, like I said, the two things you can really do are make sure your county is collecting the full amount allowed by the law. So if, if you're collecting less than the amount, that may be a political decision from your board of supervisors to be more business friendly. But if they're also pressuring you because they want to cut your programs, well, they're also not allowing you to max out your revenue. You really need to communicate with them about that. Um, the other one, like I said, is just cutting your expenses, and that's the that's the thing you have the most control over. If you can become more efficient in your program and cut your expenses so they more, more closely align with your revenues, that's the thing you probably have the most control over with your weights and measures budget. I agree. I think you you covered that. I mean, it, it that one is a lot. I feel like weights and measures is more limiting when it comes to you know, how to maneuver the program when funding changes come along. Uh, next question, are hemp and marijuana classified as below the line or above the line? Would this change if the feds ever change marijuana as a schedule one narcotic? <laughs> one is and one isn't. So, <laughs> so it's convoluted, same species of plant, one has THC, one doesn't. Um, hemp is an above the line crop. So hemp is agricultural. Any money you spend on hemp goes above the line and is subject to UGT reimbursement. Cannabis is uh, not above the line. It is below the line and it is not eligible for gas tax reimbursement. Um, there have been some instances very recently where at least one county shifted some resources from um, above the line programs to cannabis and actually didn't meet their maintenance of effort and lost a significant amount of gas tax revenue because they their county made that decision to reallocate the resources to cannabis, which was a, a below the line activity. So that, that can actually have some big consequences. That's a big deal. And um, yeah, it's, it's again, where's the cannabis law? It's in the business and professions code. Where's the hemp law? It's in the food and ag code. So just think of it in those terms and that's your answer. Excellent, I, very good answer. Um, next question that I have here, who are the key stakeholders in budget process? Great question. Everybody, everybody in your county. <laughs> um, so no, so you start with your own department and really identifying your needs and your goals, both for this year and for kind of you know, I operate in that five year window where I'm looking at this year really closely. And then I'm also kind of keeping the wheels in motion on things I want to accomplish in the next five or six years. I don't look out too much past that. Um, so obviously your own department and speaking with, you know, the, your staff about, you know, what, what we need to accomplish as a department. And then at least again, speaking for Placer County, I have a fiscal analyst in my CEO's office who is my most immediate point of contact. Her boss is a deputy CEO who I also work really closely with and communicate with in that, you know, they're kind of the gatekeepers. If it's a really big thing, I, I as an ag commissioner, I'm an appointed department head. I get to meet with the county CEO once a month and really big priorities I'll also share with him. Again, I want him to catch that vision and go, man, the ag department's doing some cool work and I really like that. So that when his staff, I'm kind of managing the CEO's office both upwards and downwards. So I want that my analysts to be bringing stuff up and saying, hey, Josh is doing cool work. 
and I and we should support it. And I want the CEO himself to bring this stuff down to her. And so they meet in the middle and they're all in agreement by the time it actually gets fleshed out. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, other departments, you know, if you can even get other department heads to recognize the importance of what you do, because sometimes it is a little bit like a, my library director likes to call it the hunger games where all the different departments are fighting over the general <laughs> fund and stuff and so you know this department or that department will think they're the only game in town and really you know i'm i'm doing i'm doing the most important work and whatever you're doing really doesn't matter compared to what i'm doing that's always a factor to play in and so really nobody else is going to advocate for you like you are um, Again, the Board of Supervisors ultimately makes that decision, but like in my county, the CEO is really the gatekeeper for the budget. There's also really specific fiscal management staff within my CEO's office. My, my, my personal analyst that works with me is more general, looks at programs as well as the budget where there's a fiscal kind of fiscal wonks that are just number crunchers and they're good good folks to keep informed of like things like, hey, SB1 passed, here's what it means to me. Um, mm -hmm. So um, other than that, you know, really the public, we have an agricultural advisory committee, we have uh, Farm Bureau, we have these different industry organizations that can also advocate on your behalf. And you can, you kind of be, got to be careful. I know board members don't like it when you feel like you've sick the public on them. You know, I'm an important, <laughs> I'm an at will appointed department head. If my board gets mad at me, every day is probation for me for my whole career. And so, you know, if I'm pulling stunts where I'm embarrassing them or feeling like I'm sicking the public on them and making their lives miserable, I'm not gonna be very long in my job. But at the same time, there's a really effective, healthy way that you can help them to tell your story for you. Of, you know, hey, why is it important to support pest detection? Well, because if we get the Asian citrus psyllid, here's how it's going to affect my Mandarin industry. And my board loves my Mandarin industry. And so they wouldn't dare do anything that would jeopardize it. So you can have your farmers kind of advocate for you in that sense. Yeah. Uh, in, uh, to add a little bit to that, there is a, a very important component to your budget, which is fees. And as we said, there are certain programs that have state caps on the fee you can recuperate. You should never be recuperating more than it's costing you, so you should always do a cost study. See if your fees are where they need to be. Uh, but there are a lot of programs that don't have fees, and the industry wants them. So you can actually use the advocacy of industry to come to you and make an official request to say, hey, we would like for you to walk our PQ fields. We know we can train our staff and certify them, but we would like the department to do it. All you have to do is work with the board, work with the CAO, see if they're open to say, can we establish a full cost recovery fee that the industry agrees with so we can conduct the work that the industry wants us to go work, which actually contributes to the mission of the Ag Department. So you can work with industry, but you do have to be very careful, as Josh said. You don't want the industry sending a letter to the board or to the CAO, or they'll send it to the board saying, you know, the Ag Commissioner told us that you should approve this program or this fee. It, it doesn't work like that but they can definitely make a request if they want you to do something that is in line with your department. And I've seen many programs in different counties actually, where you are truly providing a service to industry and the industry wants you to continue providing that service, whether it's a special inspection protocol for something they're shipping that they're required to have an inspection. We have the qualification, however, we don't have the financial means and they're willing to take on that cost to to make it work. So that, that could be an advocate for funding elements. Uh, let's see here. I think we covered that. I covered that. I think we covered everything. Any additional questions? We got a question that came in through chat here. Uh, can the CAC build DPR for cannabis work in uh, PUE? Thank you, Alex. Yeah, so that's a great question. And DPR does have dedicated funding for cannabis activities. And so uh, a good portion of that is formulaic. So there's X dollars allocated based, I think, just on the population of the county. There's some dollars allocated per, um, per operator ID that you issue. 
And then there's various dollar per hour rates in reimbursement for various activities. Like if you're doing grower education and outreach on pesticide laws and regs to cannabis producers, you can bill that at a fixed hourly rate back to DPR. So they do have, I think, a million plus dollars a year in funding to reimburse county ag commissioners for uh, cannabis related pesticide uh, use enforcement and education. Um, so yeah, great question. All right. Any other questions? Excellent. Like Josh, I, I, I have a, a painful question because we probably will be facing that. If you want to cut costs, uh, how do you document or monitor and evaluate that process? Because you don't want to create more harm. You know, you really want to how would you go about cutting a cost carefully without involving, you know, a legal dispute from HR? I mean, what is your, some of the things you look at before you decide to pull the trigger on something? So just in general, if you're saying, hey, there's a 10% yeah. budget cut mandated or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Or, I mean, or how do you, when you say, okay, I, I got to improve my, my budget, I'm going to cut some costs. I mean, do you get feedback from people? Where do you think there's ways? Do you get the analysts? I mean, what would be some strategies so that you could map it out and then measure if it's successful or, or preempt a risk, for example? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, and I, I think Jose could probably chime in on this as well, I hope, but you, know, you got to think both what's, you know, what's the time frame? Is this a, one year hiccup or is this like a long term where for the next 10 years we're going to be dealing with a different way of doing business and i think that's one of the things um you know when i look back to the economic downturn that kind of started in 2008 went through probably 2011 or 12 when we saw cdfa's budget decimated counties overall were just struggling mightily um you know i think we're in a time that's kind of the most difficult time since that kind of 2010, 11 time period. Um, you know, so I've gone through it once. I think a lot of counties are seeing it again at this point. Um, I'll speak to that previous time. Part of it was the difference between, again, the ag department versus the county as a whole. And what we saw back in that 2008 to 2011 or 12 window was all of the agricultural activity and the agricultural revenues and the agricultural fees, none of that stuff went down. Gas tax didn't go down. None of that stuff did, but county general fund got thrashed because property taxes, which are the number one source generally of general fund revenue. So the, the county's biggest source of revenue is typically property taxes and the housing bubble bursting just decimated property tax base. And so it was kind of that advocacy for balancing the fact that my little department was still in good shape while the county as a whole was, was being wiped out and, or significantly impacted, I should say, and, and kind of striking a balance between those two things first and foremost. So that's kind of at one very strategic level working with, with your management. On, on the other hand, looking at a very, close immediate level at what can I cut, you know, over time, you know, there, there's that fat that you can trim right off the bat without long-term consequences for the most part, like overtime. So like, hey, we're not gonna approve any more overtime. And there's a way to pump the brakes really easily. Again, looking at vehicle mileage and saying, hey, can we, you know, do things to reduce vehicle mileage right off the bat? You know, the, the, there's there's those kinds of things. Hey, what items did we have approved purchase? If I got two pickup trucks that are fixed asset requests that I have approved and I have old pickup trucks that I can milk for another year and keep them running, that's 60 grand I can not spend right now. Um, just looking at all of those components. So any of your discretionary items you're gonna purchase over time, vehicle mileage, just there, there's, you know, the difference between pumping the brakes and slamming the brakes on, I think, is kind of the way I think about it. And so the first thing I do is pump the brakes while I also communicate my department's situation versus the county's while acknowledging the county's overall decision. Again, maintenance of effort is a big thing that you again need to reiterate the consequences for maintenance of effort. And hey, don't put me in that downward financial spiral 
because we cut, which leads to a reduction, which leads to a cut, which leads to a reduction, and you can just circle that drain if you get into that bad point. And then there's the the next step would be, you know, the people. The people are the the expensive thing, and the extra help, the seasonal staff that you know, unfortunately, are kind of low on the to lowest on the totem pole because I think we're all for the most part unionized workforces. Mm -hmm. They have to go. And then the last thing you want to do is lay off permanent staff. I, you know, in addition to deeply caring about each of my staff as a person, I also feel like a senior or a level three inspector. It typically takes four years to build a level three inspector or a senior inspector. And that's about a $400,000 investment, you know, just in strictly dollars and cents terms. I've invested four years in building that inspector and to lose a senior inspector is a in addition to just caring about that person and not wanting to you know harm them financially and, and career wise i also don't want that investment walking out the door and really that that's kind of the way i i view that as well so and i got some of my staff on the phone so i hope they don't take offense to that <laughs> yeah. um, it's not a it's not a comfortable question but i appreciate it josh yeah thank you so Jose, you got to add to yeah. that I think as we started with the with the presentation, we have to be monitoring that horizon. We are failing if we don't. If you have to slam on the brakes and it's because suddenly a long ongoing contract dried out, maybe we were not doing our job as good as we could. You have to be monitoring that horizon. As soon as you get the cleaning, and we just got one, whole COVID taxes, we talked about it. Anybody here who doesn't, who didn't get that flag that hey, we need to be very careful right now. Do not bring in permanent positions. Uh, I will share that in my department I had, when we did the budget, I had approved additional positions. We did not hire those positions because the last thing we want to do is bring on permanent staff, invest the money in training them, having them move from wherever they move, going through all this to even, you know, if it, if it does, if the economy, as we look at next year's budget and the following year, if it does start, you know, turning around, it's going to be a significant, a, a much more costly endeavor to the department, and not just in terms in dollar of dollars. It's in terms of you know the reputation to the department that you know what we do here for people with people. Um, take advantage of salary savings. If you have vacancies, that is one of the biggest places to save money. Salary savings. If you haven't heard that term, become familiar with that term. That is the easiest way to save real tangible dollars because you know what? And then, and, you know, <laughs> some people may not agree, but to me, paper is cheap. I'm never going to balance my budget by cutting the use of paper or pencils. Yeah, it'll help, but I'm not going to balance my budget by managing the, the amount of paper and pencils we purchase or don't purchase. Big purchases of big in, in, in investments in people and capital purchases if you're going to have a new vehicle if it's already fully depreciated if it's not ideal but it's not unsafe work with your fleet department and say hey you know what is there a way that we can keep the heavy capacity truck for two more years um, maybe we don't need to move to the larger nicer building that's going to increase our facility cost. remember those are fixed costs i don't get a say so once i make that move that's a fixed cost when we build when i build the budget they actually send me the bill up front and say make sure you include this amount in your budget for the facility those are non-negotiable so there are very few other than uh really you know talking about lay layoffs there's very few areas where we can actually reduce our our budget where we we're in the business of people that's our as, as we said we've said multiple times our biggest cost is people so if your budget suddenly gets cut by downtown by 25%, most likely that's going to cut into the meat yep. or the bone. <laughs> yeah. Any, any, any other thoughts on that, Josh? No, they, thank you. That was, that was great, Jose. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, we are at almost at 4.30. Um, if there, is there any other questions that I might have missed there? If I don't hear any more, then I think we're going to wrap it up. Again, I did want to thank you, Josh, for spending the time for actually a lot of insight. Um, 
definitely a big takeaway. The, philosoph the philosophy and the tactical elements of your budget Kung Fu, I think we can definitely use that. Uh, it, it's, we kind of know that it happens, but we don't get an opportunity to hear it. So it is very refreshing to hear you say, you know, how you go about, how you troubleshoot these situations, how you manage, you know, the, the horizon, the changes, the challenges, and then even the technical stuff. So thank you for taking the time. Uh, to Good everybody in the call, we will get the recording and we will post it in our website and the case of website will be available if you ever want to come back and revisit uh, you know, the presentation and the Q&A, which I think it's a lot of very good information. Josh, any, any last words? No, thank you all. And uh, um, really appreciate everything that KSAP does. And uh, it was a pretty non-functional organization when I first started out. And it's awesome to see how, how uh, so many folks have really stepped up to the plate and showed leadership and really turned this, turned this organization into something fantastic and a, a huge resource. So really appreciate all of you. Thank you. All right. Well, in that case, uh, again, enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your week. Uh, have a good one. Thank you. Thank you both. Bye. Bye.